Thank you so much for taking time um, away from your demanding day to attend another critical conversation meeting hosted by our superintendent of schools, Dr. Morsi J. Beasley. We certainly appreciate those who are returning and for those who are joining us for the first time. Um, you are in for a treat to learn more about our school district and ways that you can become instrumental if you haven't in supporting our commitment to high performance. Uh, one of the things I would like to do before I turn the mic over to our superintendent is acknowledge our board member who's present this evening, Mr. Tori Williams, if you will stand and be recognized. Thank you for coming. And I know that we have many uh, school district leaders and principals present with us this evening. So as you can see, we are all committed to high performance and sharing in those endeavors to making our school district and communities a safer place to live, work, and learn. So without further ado, I will turn the mic over to our illustrious leader, Dr. Morsi J. Beasley. Thank you, baby. Good afternoon, everybody. All the staff people stand up. I want all the staff so I can see how many community folks we have here. <laughs> Very good. So you get all of our attention today. <laughs> Very good. We know it's 6 o'clock and others will be joining us. Principals, identify yourselves. Let's get away for all our principals. I see love joy in the house. Very good. Glad to have you all here. Um, middle school, are you still at the middle school? No, you at the high school now? Okay. Very good. And you at the high school. Okay. Very good. Well, Thank you all for being here today. We're going to go ahead and start. We have an agenda. We're going to stick with the agenda. We appreciate, of course, our board member, Ms. Um, Williams, being here. It gives us a, an opportunity to really just interact and dialogue with you. We're going to go through the presentation first, and then we're going to do Q&A at the end, OK? But we're going to go through the presentation in an expedited fashion. We do want you to know if you want to keep up with us all with the presentation, you go right down to the website. And on the links on the left side of the web page, look for the link that has critical conversations. You can hit that link, it will take you to the presentation. And of course, this event is also being live streamed, so all the speakers will have to speak into the microphone. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing we want to do, of course, is review our vision. And in short, our vision is to become a high-performing school system. Momentarily, I'll share with you some characteristics of a high-performing school district. But the bottom line is this, we just expect all of our students to do well. It is unacceptable for students to not do well. It is unacceptable for schools to fail. It's unacceptable for uh, any particular subgroup to fail and to not improve. Everyone is expected to do what? Improve, period. In order to be a high performing school district, make no mistake, you need high performing educators. And guess what else you need? You need high performing communities. That means it's just not the superintendent's responsibility, it's just not the principal or the teacher's responsibility, it's everybody's what? Responsibility. And so we're here to work together, we're here to work as a team. We are uniquely positioned as the educators to impact what happens during the school day, right? But all of us who have uh, children know very well that education just doesn't occur during the school day. There's much that has to be done by parents before children get to school and after they come <coughs> to school. And so that's why it's a community affair, it's a village effort, it's everybody's responsibility to help produce a high performing school system. We want our students to be able to live and compete, live and compete, live and compete. We want them to earn good incomes, good incomes. It's time to, you know, the one thing about America, you gotta understand whether you like it or not, it's just reality. The level of one's education often dictates the level of one's what? One's pay. And so if, you, if you're in a system and that's how the system works, if that's how the game is played, you gotta know how to what? Play the game. And so in, in this nation, in this world, education is part of the, 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 you know, the monopoly money to pay, play the game, to, to get where you need to go, then everybody needs to be thinking about getting a, an education. And so we need all of our children, everybody. It, it, it can't be all, oh, that's not important. It's, it's gotta be important. Why is it important? Because your family's quality of life depends on it. It is very important. And so we want to really convey and impress upon all of our community, our students, that 
Education is very important. Our mission is to empower students to basically achieve their personal and academic goals every day. That's our mission. That's our work we do every day in our schools. Principals and teachers are working with students to ensure that the students have identified goals and that they achieve those goals. That, that goal could be reading. That goal could be doing a better job on math or particular uh, doing better on tests. Whatever it is, set goals and work toward those goals. I mean, you know, good habits don't start when you're old. They start young, don't they? And so we need to ensure in our schools that our young people are working to set goals and then we support them towards achieving those goals. We want to be very clear. Our core beliefs are there. Hopefully you've seen this information. If not, I encourage you to go to the website. But our core beliefs are basically focused on our children. I can promise, I can assure you and promise you that every decision we make will be in the best interest of children. This administration, our principals, our teachers, we are going to make decisions in the best interest of children. Now, are there times when we have adults that we have to deal with who don't make decisions in the best interest of children? Of course, when you have 7,000 grown folk working with children, somebody's not going to do something right all the time. And so we have structures and procedures in place to deal with that. But I want to assure you that it is, it is our expectation, and we're working toward this, to ensure that we hold ourselves accountable for always doing what's in the best interest of all children in the school system. So our beliefs are very clear. Children get the priority for our resources. We understand education as a shared respons responsibility. All of us in the community have a part to play. We want to ensure that we're communicating and that we're understanding one another, understanding the work. That's one reason we have these opportunities such as today. We want to also acknowledge that learning is a continuous process, so no matter where the student begins, we want to add value to their educational experience. And by the end of their time with us, we know that the next person picks up where they end. And so, from one year to the next, we expect students to improve and to make progress. And we build on what was done prior to them getting to us. And lastly, we want to ensure that we have the, the best environment, a caring environment, a respectful environment, and one in which we show dignity and that we provide our students the opportunity to be respected, to be cared for, and to demonstrate dignity themselves. So our strategic goals, we have five, and these are the goals that will guide our work for the next five years. The first one is related to achievement. The bottom line is we've got to improve our outcomes. And so while schools have a lot going on, and they should, that's what schools are, they're educational institutions, they're social institutions, a lot goes on in schools, a lot of activities, but the number one, one activity should be education. We need to ensure that our students are reading on grade level, doing math on grade level, thinking critically, collaborating, communicating, and being creative. It is very, very important that all of our children achieve in their educational outcomes. And so you'll hear more about what we're doing to ensure that that occurs. Number two, we've got to maintain an orderly, safe environment. Schools should not be chaotic and they should not be unsafe. And so when you walk into schools, it's our expectation that the school is orderly, that it looks like somebody's in charge, and it looks like people are teaching. And they should be teaching. We shouldn't teach students in the hallway, running and ruling hallways. That is just not going to happen. And clearly, when it does happen, I want y'all to go to him right here, <laughs> Dr. Simpson. But I can assure you that is not the case. We've been in school, what, seven weeks now? And if you walk in any school, they are having school the way they should be having school. We want to ensure that we have an environment that promotes active engagement. And that's, again, why we have these opportunities. We want you to be engaged. We don't know it all. You don't know it all. But when we get together, hopefully we can figure out what we need to do to move this school system forward. We want to ensure that we're understanding each other, that we're holding one another accountable, and that we're collaborating. When there are issues, we should come to the table and figure out what do we need to do to get it solved. It's not about uh, the superintendent, it's not about you, it's not about the staff, it's not about the principal. We try to take the personality out of it and focus on the work. What needs to be done to move the school district forward? A lot of folk get stuck on personality, and at the end of the day, they pay up a community that way. Because we all have different what? Personalities. The focus, the, the, the work should be, we should be mature enough to deal with all different types of personalities. And some of you just have to say, I'm not going to deal with that personality and move on. 
But the bottom line is, you gotta focus on the work, regardless of the personality. Number four, we want to provide high quality support services to our students. We realize that sometimes our students are dealing with issues that negatively impact the learning in the classroom. Therefore, we provide support beyond the classroom to help students navigate those issues. Let's make no mistake, life happens to us all. Life is happening to our children. On any given day, we have children who come from homes that don't have light, gas, heat, AC, Water, you all don't think about that because you all probably have all of that. But on any, any given day, there's a percentage of our students whose water is not working. Did y'all realize that? Oh, yeah. Now, we don't, we don't think about that. There's a percentage of our students who have come to school, and guess what? Parents were fussing and fighting that somebody got arrested the night before. And, of course, it doesn't happen with a whole lot on a daily basis, but on the average, and over the course of the year, just imagine that happening to many students, and over the course of all the grade levels and over many years, many of our students have been impacted. Make no mistake, everybody down at the, the county jail that they live here in Clayton County, they are related to somebody, aren't they? And so our students are impacted by adult decisions. Our children are impacted by adult decisions. Therefore, we have to mitigate for the impact on their instructional process. And then of course, number five, we want to recruit, develop, and retain competent, qualified people to lead schools, teach classrooms, serve in other roles, be superintendent. You want competent people. You want people, and then once you recruit competent people, people that are effective, you want to retain them. Somebody says, well, superintendent, what are you doing to retain? Let's make it very clear to everybody. I don't carry that burden alone. I will never carry that burden alone. I am not the only one responsible for retaining. Everybody in this community is responsible for retaining who? Teachers. How you interact with teachers determines how much we retain teachers. How you respect teachers determines how much we what? Retain teachers. How, I'll even tell the elected officials how y'all act on television. <laughs> determines if people want to come to our community and stay where? In our community because they have choices. Make no mistake, you're in the metro Atlanta area just like you chose to live here. Others are looking to find places to live and guess what? They want to live in the best place for their what? For their families and their children. And so I tell people all the time, all of us are on display. As a community, we're on display. If you want the best teachers, you've got to present yourself as the best what? Community. Because people want to go to successful places. You can't just be cutting up and everything, all bad news coming out of play. You think teachers are going to tear down the, the, the uh, they're going to burn up I 75 to get here. It ain't going to happen that way. Excuse my bad English. It will not happen that way. You've got to bring down the drama and raise up the high levels of performance and expectation if you want to recruit and retain great teachers. And I don't mind telling anyone that. I've shared that with the chamber. I've shared it with all the elected officials. I've shared it with everybody I can tell because everyone has to bear some responsibility on the messaging that goes out beyond Clayton County about what? Clayton County because that messaging, impact, it, it impacts who moves here, it impacts who stays here. Does that make sense, everybody? So those are our goals. High performance. I've already alluded to this, but high performance is basically whatever we're measuring, and we measure quite a few things. We measure reading scores, math scores. We also measure discipline and attendance. We measure employee morale. Whatever we're measuring, we expect it to improve. So if we have 65 schools, we expect 65 schools to do what? Improve. When 65 schools improve, guess what happens? The district does what? improve. If we're measuring reading scores, I don't care where students start today. Some start on grade level, some start well below grade level. It doesn't matter where they start. By the end of the year, they should be better, shouldn't they? They should be better. That's the expectation. That's high performance. So if the data tells us this year so many kids or so many percent of kids are doing well, we expect to see that improve if it's not 100%. The goal is to move all the data in the right direction, all the positive data in the right direction, all the negative data, hopefully eliminate it. And clearly, if we do that, we have a high performing school district. So very quickly, I just want to just share with you the nine characteristics, characteristics of high performing schools. This is our framework. And when these things occur in some combination, to some degree, uh, in a school, 
it moves towards higher levels of performance. And the first one is a clear and shared focus. That would be the responsibility of the leadership of the system. Superintendent's the leadership of the system to determine the focus and make sure it's clear and it's shared with everyone. That's why we have these type of opportunities. Number two, high standards and expectations for all students. All students. It's just not enough to say we're having a school system. There are many, many school systems. But there are many school systems that don't have high expectations for all students. They expect some students to do well and they expect some students to fail and they don't do anything about that. That will not be the case. That is not the case for uh, this school system. We expect all students to do well. We expect all students to come to school and when they're not, we're going to do something about it. We expect them to behave well when they come to school and when they're not, we're going to do something about it. We expect them to learn how to read and write and do math and when they don't, we're going to do something what? about it because we expect it is unacceptable for students to fail and we not do something what about it and if you don't do something about it if you don't have that expectation you don't have high standards and high expectations for all students number three effective school leadership bottom line is this from the superintendent on down those of us who lead in the school system we're expected to be effective if you are principal of a school then you should improve the school if you are Superintendent, you should improve the school system. And it takes all of us working together. If you're the leader of a department and you're responsible for certain things, you should improve that department. Effective <coughs> leadership, effective leadership. So we're monitoring our leadership. The next area, high levels of collaboration and communication. We have many opportunities for parents and others to get engaged. There are many opportunities at the school level. There are many opportunities at the district level. This is exact one of those examples. We have many superintendent advisories that are open to anyone. We did not even identify in a select criteria. We left it open for anyone who wanted to come and engage with us and share and, and help us problem solve and figure out what do we need to do to move our district forward. Schools have many opportunities to get parents engaged, whether it be PTAs, or PTSAs, or school councils, or all the many other activities that are going on. The question is, and I know we're all busy, the question is, are people taking full advantage of those opportunities to be engaged? The next one is curriculum instruction and assessment aligned with standards. Just know this, we know exactly what students should know and be able to do, and we have standards and our teachers are teaching that those standards. They're using resources that we purchased that they've identified and they basically share these are the resources that we'd like to use. They're using those resources. We have assessment <coughs> and we're in the instructional process. Teaching, assessing, teaching, assessing. Using our data to figure out if our students are going in the direction that we expect them to go in. And the last few, frequent monitoring of learning and teaching. Of course, what we expect is we monitor. And so we have a plan. We visit every school. We go in classrooms. We observe. We collect data. We give feedback. We have certain instructional practices we want to see in every classroom. It's very clear. It's been consistently communicated to all. We train individuals if they don't know. There are many opportunities for individuals to receive training. We train our principals on what good teaching and learning looks like. And we monitor that. The next one, focus professional development. If you stand before children, you should always be learning. As you learn, your children will learn. And so you will know, and you should know that in our school system at every level, at all, no matter what one's position, we're expected to learn and to continue to learn. We have numerous opportunities for that to occur. Support a learning environment, basically, like I said earlier, providing students the support that they need in order to be successful. And then lastly, high levels of family and community involvement. We want to ensure that our families are engaged. And that level of engagement or that engagement occurs at several levels. There's classroom engagement, being engaged with the teachers, checking grades on them for the campus. There's school-wide engagement if you're uh, beyond the, the classroom, attending events and making sure that you're a part of the school improvement process. And then, of course, we have district-level engagement for those who just want to really see some changes and be involved at the, at the district level in the work, the direction that the district is going in. 
So at this time, what we'd like to do is give uh, Pastor Mike, we've got a few people that are going to come. I'm going to pass it to Dr. Wiley, and she's going to share our strategic plan, uh, which is our really our roadmap, our strategy map for the work that we're doing for the next five years. Good evening, everyone. I'm Monica Wiley, the Director of Fine Arts and School Choice, and I do oversee the strategic planning process for the district. You should have a copy of our strategic improvement plan, well, basically an abbreviated copy. We posted the long version on our website, so if you have the opportunity, please go to our website and review the strategic improvement plan. Dr. Beasley did an excellent job going over what is in the strategic plan, and everyone that comes after me will also share the strategic improvement plan, what their department is doing to align itself with the strategic improvement plan. So I will share with you what we are doing now in relation to this plan. We are right now going through the action steps, and we created an action plan, and we are looking at the baseline data. Once we determine our baseline data, you will be able to review that online. We will have everything there that is in this strategic improvement plan, where we are and where we're going. So after we have our baseline data, we are going to update our data every nine weeks. So we're doing the baseline data now. In October, we're going to let our community know where we are as it relates to our data. And then in, again in December, March, and then May, so that we can ensure that we are being transparent. And part of our advanced ed uh, report that I reviewed again today states that we were emerging with engaging our community. So now we want to move from emerging to meet expectation and then exceeding expectation. So being transparent with our strategic improvement plan and where we are with our data is part of growing our district and improving our district. And with that being said, I am going to hand the microphone over to the Ms. Gray. Dr. Beasley. Very quick. Again, this is on the website for you. Uh, we started out with the uh, letting you see that we're improving with our behavior. You know, when I became superintendent last year, several sessions we had, people talked about behavior, didn't they? And we started to address, uh, continue to address culture issues, climate issues, uh, rituals and routines after schools. Even this year, principals are still going through various trainings to help improve things at the campus, identifying, responding. So I want you to see very quickly, we've identified here the tip, the top 10 behavior referral offenses. And this is the raw data that allows you to see that the number of offenses is actually uh, uh, decreasing. So you can see last year from the previous school year, all the green numbers are decreasing. It lets you see the percent that we're decreasing. We've got a way to go because ideally we'd like to have a, a school system when where, where we don't have the numbers that we have here. Uh, but that takes time, and it takes the effort of not just the school system, but families as well. Families as well. And so we're working to improve that, but we've got a ways to go. Our end of grade data. End of grade data would be, that's what we call EOG, end of grade. This would be in grades three through eight, and so, on the Georgia milestones, we want to show you exactly what percent of our students are proficient. That means they're performing for the most part on grade level with the content. And so you can see, uh, I think there's a slide we may have skipped. Let's go back. Very good. 
good. ELA, I want you to see how we've done over the last four years since we've had the new Georgia milestones. And as you know, if you don't know, you should know, the Georgia milestones are based upon national standards. The state adopted national standards in 2010, and so they're rigorous standards. They are higher level. The tests are more rigorous. And so you can see for Clayton County, what percent of our students are proficient in ELA, English Language Arts? For third grade, roughly 22%. Fourth grade, 30%. Grade five, 26%. And that's an increase from the previous year for those grades. Grade six and seven at 25 and 24%, a decrease of about one, one to two points. And then grade eight is the same from the previous year. You can see very clearly how we compare to the MRESA. The MRESA would be the metropolitan districts like your DeKalb, Gwinnett, Douglas County, et cetera. Um, and look at their proficient rates, 41%, 46%, fourth grade, and so on, fifth grade, 46%. And you can see how we do it compared to the state of Georgia. Do you see a gap there between how we're doing and how the MRESA is doing? Yes, you do. You do. It's a gap. And then, of course, the gap between us and the state of Georgia. So we've got work to do. We've got work to do. That's why I say it's a community affair. It's a community affair. Look at how we're doing in math. Grade 3, 32% proficient. Grade 4, 32% proficient. Grade 5, 21% proficient. Grade 6, a decrease of one point from the previous year, 20% proficient. Grade 7, 23% proficient. That's an increase. Grade 8, 16% proficient. That's a decrease. And look at how we have a gap between the MRESA and the state. Science, similarly, you can see grades 5 and 8. We only test science in grades 5 and 8, and we only test social studies in grades 5 and 8. And you can see the uh, in grade 5, we decreased by one point. We're at 23%. Grade 8, we increased up to 13%. Look at how we compare with the MRES in Georgia. And similarly, social studies, we increased in both grades, 5 and 8. And you should know that we, in, we um, implemented new standards for both of these content areas last year. And so it's very good when you implement new standards to even see an increase. So we went up by one point in grade 5 in social studies and two points uh, in grade 8 in social studies. And you can see how we compare to the MRESA in the state of Georgia. Uh, in the course, that would be the high school courses. There are certain courses, about eight courses, that our students take that have an end of course or a test at the end of the course. I want you to see ninth grade lit, 36%. That's an increase from the previous year. American Lit, that's normally in the 11th grade, is at 28% proficient, decrease of one point. Algebra 1, at 16% proficient, decrease from the previous year of one point. Geometry went up to 22%. Biology stayed the same at 29%. Physical Science went up by 1%, one point to 27%. U.S. History stayed the same at 29% uh, proficient, and economics went up by 1% to 38%, 1 percentage point. And you can see how we're comparing to the MREs again in the state of Georgia, okay? The next thing is our reading data. I want you to see the percent of students who are actually reading at or above grade level. Now, you'll notice that the percent of students reading is higher than the percent of students proficient. That's a gap. That means why can't our kids read but they seem to not be able to pass the content test. And that's work that we're, uh, an area that we're working on. Grade three, I want you to see for our district, 57% of our students are at or above grade level in reading. Grade four, 52%. Grade five, 58%. Grade six, 46%. Grade seven and grade eight, 59% both. So we got about, on average, about 55 to 60% of our kids who are reading at or above grade level, so that means about 40% or not. We've got work to do. We've got work to do as a community. Let's talk about high schools. What percent in high school are reading at or above grade level? I'm just going to quote these so you can see them. Drew High School, 60%. Elite Scholars is at 97%. Forest Park at 66%, Jonesboro at 66%, Lovejoy at 67%, uh, Stillwell at 97%, Morrow at 73%, 
Mount Zion at 63%, Monday Mill at 60%, North Clayton High School at 62%, Riverdale High School at 69, almost 70%. That means we've got still quite a few students in high school who are not doing what? Reading where? On grade level, but they still got to pass those classes, don't they? See, when I, when, I, when I talk about the work of a community, we don't have time for drama, do we? We got time to do work. We got to do what? We got work to do because these kids have got to compete. They got to get jobs. They got to go to college. And I know you got to read in order to go get through college, don't you? And now most tests, most jobs have a test, don't they? So if you can't read, more than likely, you won't do well on a test to get the job. And then we wonder why we have so many caught up in the cycle of poverty. See, this is, this is the work right here. This is our work. And we've got to, as a community, fix it. So we're going to talk about what we're doing. Advanced placement. You know our kids can take certain courses, college level courses. And at the end of the course, they take a test called the AP test. If they make three, four, or five on the AP test, the college may give them credit. So that may be a class that they don't have to take once they get to college. But well, I want you to see how we're doing as a county on our advanced placement course, our advanced placement outcomes. So you can see very clearly, I want to say first, Georgia has a 50, almost 59% AP, uh, passing AP rate for three, four, or five. Remember that, Georgia is about 59%. So since you can't see this, Drew is at 22%. Elite Scholars is at 26%. Forest Park is at, I'm sorry, let me go up in the wrong column. Drew is at 6%. Elite Scholars is at 35% now. They increased from the previous year. Forest Park is now at 21%, increased from the previous year. Jonesboro is at 8%. Lovejoy is at 8%. Steelville, 45%. Morrow, 43%. Mount Zion, about 7%, Monday's Mill about 11%, North Clayton 11%, Riverdale about 14.5%, an increase from the previous year. As a system, we're about 19.4% of our students who are taking the AP test passing with the 345, compared to the state, which is about 60%. So we have a gap in AP. So that means our kids are sitting in AP classes all year. And when they take the AP exam, only 19% of them are making a three, four, or five. Do we have work to do? Oh, yes, we do. How do you sit at AP all year? College level. So we've got work to do. Graduation rates. You should know these are graduation rates from last year, 2017. The grad rates for 2018 will come out tomorrow. Come out tomorrow. Come out tomorrow, but I want you to know all that data that I just reviewed, all of that impacts your graduation outcomes, doesn't it? It's all connected. It's all connected. So I won't go over these numbers here because the data will come out tomorrow. I'll say this, because I can't share the data until the governor releases the data tomorrow. You'll get a news blast as soon as he releases the data. A minute later, I told Mr. White, a minute later, he's got to send everybody the data to your emails. We improved. You all should know we improved. Right now, all of the schools are over 70 for the first time in the history of this county. Yeah. First time. <laughs> Listen to this. Out of the 11 regular high schools, we have 11 regular high schools. We have one alternative high school. We call it, it was a program, it's now a high school. It's one. Out of the 11 regular high schools, seven of them have a a rate of 80 or higher. Seven out of 11. Y'all can clap the place. That's pretty good. That hasn't happened before. Two of those seven have a perfect grad rate. Yes. That's not bad. The others, the four who are not in the 11, they're in the 70s. So, and all of them improved from the previous year. Every school that could improve did what? Improve. So, the one high school that is an alternative school that we knew would be low would be Perry Academy. And so I would tell you all, we need to continue to support those students because many of them would have dropped out by now. And so but that's our effort of supporting them because it's better that they eventually earn a high school diploma than they not get one at all, right? 
And so we don't make, as we told Dr. Young, we don't make a big issue about Perry having his grant rate low because we know what's going on over there. And you all should know as a community that our strategy is to, within the next five years, our goal is to get everybody at a minimum at 90% grant rate. At the rate we're going, we'll be able to do that. But remember that data feeds into it. And so I won't go through all these slides. Again, the presentation is there for you to see. Jada, let's just go to the next slide. What are we doing to increase grad rate? This is a few of the strategies. We're monitoring our ninth grade. We know that if they can get past ninth grade, we can keep them in school. Ninth grade is a very transitional year, and it's a year if we lose students. If, if we lose a student, that's the year we lose them. And so we've got to, and we are working to monitor academics, attendance, and discipline. Working closely with the families. We're implementing credit recovery. So in the event kids are struggling, they fail a course, our goal is to help them recover that class quickly. Now wait, you take a ninth grade class, you don't want to wait till your senior year to make up that class. We need you to make that class up at ninth grade or immediately following ninth grade in the summer. And so we're working to do that. We're working to get more of our kids in advanced placement and dual enrollment. Yeah, the results are, can be improved, but that doesn't, we shouldn't stop and discourage our kids from taking advantage of those college level courses. And so we want to encourage more of that. We have career pathways. We want all of our kids in a career pathway. Our data tells us that the students who are in career pathways, their grad rate is 93%. So it makes sense to me that if we want kids, more kids to graduate, we need to get them where? In a career what? pathways. So it just makes, I just wonder, why is it such a strain to get every kid in a career pathway? So we're working to make sure that every kid identifies and participates in a career pathway. I mentioned ninth grade transition events to help the, the transition, if you will, and then of course we're using Perry Academy for those students who just having difficulty beyond what the traditional school can handle. We want them in school, but sometimes the traditional environment is just not for them. Not for them. And so just a few other strategies we're using. Once you get the release tomorrow, you'll see the other strategies uh, delineated. So at this time, we're going to ask Ms. Gray. Ms. Gray is one of our coordinators, our ELA coordinator, and she's going to represent teaching and learning today, and she's going to try to give you a high-level view of what we're doing in the area of teaching and learning to flip this data. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Like Dr. Beasley said, I'm LSR Gray. I'm the Secondary English Language Arts Coordinator, and I am here today to provide updates from the Department of Curriculum, Instruction, and Assessment on behalf of our director, Dr. Ebony Lee. And so the first thing that I want to do is start with talking to you about what we're doing to improve our data outcomes. And so the first thing that we're doing is we are trying to strengthen the alignment between our curriculum, our instruction, and our assessment. I feel that this equilateral triangle is the perfect illustration of our goal because all sides are equal. And that's truly what we want for curriculum, instruction, and assessment. All three are important and all three must be rigorous. And so we know that our core curriculum, which is our Georgia Standards of Excellence, we know that our standards, which are non-negotiable, they are written so that they are rigorous. We also know that our accountability assessments, our Georgia Milestones assessments, they are also rigorous. They align to the standards. And our goal is to ensure that the instruction that our students are receiving daily is equally as rigorous. And so in order for our students to actually achieve rigorous expectations, we know that our instruction must not only be rigorous, but it must also be relevant to our students. They must understand what they're learning, why they're learning it, and how they're going to use it in life beyond the academic setting every day. And so we have partnered with ICLE to ensure that we have a common understanding throughout our district among teachers and leaders about what rigorous and relevant instruction looks like. And ultimately, that top left right box, that quad B, is essentially what we want. We want our instruction to be so that students are expected to do the work and to do the thinking. So the current reality, 
I love this image because it really illustrates what the current reality in our classrooms is on a daily basis. So you see this um, image and above each child's head there is a lexile level. And you'll see that those lexile levels are varying. We have some students who are well below the grade level expectation and we have some students who are above the grade level expectation. So we have many learners with different needs, different deficits, different background experiences, but they are all required to meet the same expectations. So in addition to providing daily rigorous core instruction, we also have adopted some readiness tools to meet the needs of our students who need that extra cushion or that extra support. All right, so at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Simpson. Thank you, good evening. Good evening. So if everything that I know about the definition of the word culture tells me, or tells me about who we are or what that represents. Dr. Beasley mentioned this earlier when, he's talk, when he mentioned about high performing culture and climate. So this summer, we spent a good bit of time with our leaders and we wanted them to have a very, very good understanding of what that meant as it relates to their school. One thing that I do know, if you don't define and establish a culture, meaning that if the children don't step into your culture, then you end up stepping into theirs. Yes. If that takes place, then I can guarantee you that there's likely to be some problems. So what we've done with the training is to make sure that each and every principal, each and every leader in their school is defined what it is and what in terms of what that culture is going to look like. It's just the feel. It, it is the it is who we are and what we stand for. And every school, every school came up with or identified and defined a standard operating procedure. It's the same thing as rituals and routines. It's just the way we do business. I mean from the time that the buses pull up on the parking lot, children know exactly where they're supposed to be. They're greeted with an adult, an adult in a supervisory position. They define the hallways they walk down, whether they enter into the cafeteria in the morning for breakfast, whether they go to the gymnasium until the bell rings, or hallways they dismiss. Now, all of those things are important. Why? If I would ask you a rhetorical question, what's most important? Culture and climate or curriculum and instruction? And you don't have to answer that. But I can almost guarantee you this. Without culture and climate, which we've identified as the foundation, there is no teaching and learning. So we've got to have the culture and climate. It's, it's got to be, and it has to be, conducive to teaching and learning. So the feel, and Dr. Beasley says this all the time, despite what might look, what it might look like, or what it may look like in the school community. Once a child, once a parent, once a stakeholder crosses the threshold of the schoolhouse door, then you should feel something different. It should feel better. And we want it to feel better. We want people to walk into our buildings and believe and feel that this is a totally different experience than what I internalize in my, in, in, in my community. And the principals take ownership of that. That's very, very important. So the field, one other thing that it did, they identified their headlines for the end of the school year. Dr. Beasley talked about the headlines. The headlines, the data, the results, because that's the business that we're in. What is the headline? What is your headline going to read at the end of the year? Graduation high school, graduation rate of high school. Their headline read obviously that they have been some increases in their graduation rate. That's important. That's the headline that they've established. So every elementary, every middle, every high school, they've identified that. One other thing, they also identified the impact. What does that mean? That you should know what it is that a particular school has branded itself as. You should know that this is what's most important, this is popular, and this, this is our selling call for our school. And principals have identified those type of things, regardless of the fact that, that we know that the business that we're in is obviously to increase teaching and learning, increase academic achievement, I'm sorry. But what else is it? It's the value added. It's got to be more than just the, the moral responsibility that a child that comes into your class at a certain grade level or at a certain level should not go backwards. That's personal. And every teacher, every leader should take it personal. Because if we were to have an individual conversation with a parent, 
and the child at the beginning of the school year, and I sit down and I say, Mom, this is what your child is, and it's August. And at the end of the school year in May, I sit down with you again and say, Mom, your child has gone backwards. As a teacher, as an educator, I can't have that conversation. We don't want teachers to have that conversation. That's why we're equipping them with all of the resources, all of the training that Ms. Grace spoke of, so that they're equipped and trained and understand that it is important. Matter of fact, it's critical. It's even a matter of life and death because we can't afford to regress. We're not in the business of regressing. So Dr. Beasley talked about gaps. Yes, there are gaps, but we have strategy. We have strategies so that we will and that we will continue to improve all day long. All day long we're strategizing. All day long we're planning. After hours we're planning, we're texting, we're sending emails. All day long, 24-7. This is the work that goes on. And so the, that gap will close. That, that gap will close. It's a community effort, though. It's a community effort. And, and with your support, we'll get it done. Thank you. Dr. Nunez. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Sandra Nunez, and I am the Deputy Superintendent for Student Support. And um, I, I hear, I heard alignment from Dr. Wiley, and I, and I hear um, the work that CIA um, is doing to teach our students, and the work that the principals are doing in our schools, and there is a lot going on, as Dr. Beasley said. Well, we need to prepare our students with supporting learning environments, and we need to get them ready to learn. And that's what we do in the Division of Support Services. Our counselors with social emotional learning, focusing on, the, on making sure that our students are meeting those graduation requirements. Our nurses are working on making sure that our students are immunized, that their students can see and hear and be ready to learn and, and they are healthy in the classrooms. Our behavior intervention <coughs> specialists ensure that our students have that discipline, improve the discipline, and improve their behaviors in order to learn, because if they're not behaving in the classroom, they cannot learn. Our special education students with the support and the accommodations they need to have access to the curriculum. And all those individuals work together. They have to work together. They have to connect in a coherent, collaborative, and with effective communication in the circle of support. And they build capacity for principals, because the principals have a lot on their plates, the assistant principals have a lot on their plates. They build capacity for principals to support the students in their learning. That's what we're doing in the division of uh, student support services. When we talk about our discipline data and improving our discipline data, our, that's where we intervene with, for example, I'm going to give you just an example, the Positive Behavior Intervention and Supports Program. And uh, 40 of our schools are now involved in PBIS. The other 24 are very involved in what we call MTSS, which is our multi-tier system of supports. And what they do is that they establish the expected behaviors that the students need to have in the school, and that matches with that field that Dr. Simpson was talking about. The expected behaviors are there, they're posted. When we go to the schools, you see it. You see what our students expect to, they are expected to do. Our, what we believe is that as students, we teach content, right? But we all, we tend, we all tend to punish behavior, don't we? All right? Well, positive behavior interventions teaches positive behaviors. We are teaching behaviors to our students, positive behaviors to our students. So that's one example. We also focus on attendance. And overall, the district has a very good attendance rate. Most of our schools are over 90% attendance. However, we do recognize that we have students who are frequent flyers in, at, and do not come to school or are not there as much as we need them to be there in order to learn. And our, um, our students who are chronically absent, okay, aligning our efforts 
We have this little campaign here. We miss you. Those students will miss you. And we tell them too many absences, excuse or unexcused, can keep students from succeeding in school and in life. How many are too many? 10%. 10%. If we have our students being absent two days per month or 18 days in a year, that is a student who is chronically absent. And we need to work on that. So those are a few examples of the work that we're doing in the Division of Support Services. Thank you very much. Chief. Good evening, everyone. I'm Thomas Trevor, Chief of Safety and Security. And, you know, I heard a few things this evening. One I heard is it takes all of us to work together to ensure that we're performing, high performance. Well, you know, when you look at safety and security, it's the same thing. If you're counting on a law enforcement officer to keep the school safe alone, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work, it's not gonna happen. It takes all of us working collaboratively to keep the school safe. So you say, okay, Chief, how, how do we do that? How do we accomplish this? Well, one way is this. If you see something, say something. And I know you all have heard this through commercials and through ads, so on and so forth, but it's absolutely true. Because normally when something is about to occur, people will talk about it. They will share that information. And quite often, individuals will say, you know, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to snitch. Um, I don't want to tell. But here's the challenge with the stop snitching. I don't want to snitch until what? It impacts me. And then once it impacts me, I want to snitch on everybody. <laughs> if Jesus was here, I'd tell on him. <laughs> right? So we have to and we've created a, a process so that individuals can share information. We created an app, and it's basically see something, say something. We're gonna pass the, the pamphlet around, but I encourage all of you all to take the pamphlet. The instructions on how to go download the app is, of course, in the pamphlet. So encourage your students, friends, and anyone else you come in contact with to go ahead and get involved. Another way that we want to keep the schools safe is we want to create that climate. You know, Dr. Simpson was up here and he spoke about culture and climate. That means everything. We want to make sure that we have a, a culture and climate of safety. We want the students to feel safe. And that's by any means uh, uh, available. And one way, it's like uh, Dr. Beasley mentioned, when you walk on, you want the school clean. You want the students participating in programs. And then you want to have processes in place so that we can check. And one process is our safe school checks. And you know what I'm pleased to announce, I have a principal here. We searched Lovejoy this morning. And I must admit, I've been in the district two years, this is year three. This was the best school safety search we have done since we've been in the district. So give Dr. Lister Render a round of applause. There was no pushback, the students were complaining, they were receptive to the searches, and guess what the parents were doing? Thumbs up, keep it going, keep doing this. So what we're getting is, is we're getting buy-in. People are really pleased to see that we're at least trying to be proactive to keep the schools safe. Another thing that we're doing are the gang awareness seminars. You know we have a bit of a problem, it's not as bad as it used to be, but we have some challenges with our games in Clayton County. So what we want to do, we want to reach out to students and discourage them from participating in gang activity. And of course, I mentioned the tip line. We also are into mentoring. We want to make sure that we give our opportunities to have our students' opportunities to have a role model, someone that they can look up to, to guide them and mentor them in the right direction. And I'm not going to read off all of the rest of them, but there's one thing that I want to mention, and I want to mention the training. And that's the first bullet here, the National Association of School Resource Officers. And I'm pleased to say that we have certified all of our SROs. And please give us a round of applause for that. Because it goes to what Dr. Beasley mentioned, training, recruiting, and retaining the good officers who want to treat our kids right. Because one thing I want to do is I want to change the paradigm. 
You know, people aren't thinking favorably of police officers nowadays. I mean, you guys know it. She kind of, you know, laughed about it. But we want to be a resource. We don't want to be a hindrance. We want our students to know that if you have a problem, don't run from us. Run to us. You know, it's apparent that I'm an officer just based on the uniform. And you know, the schools are what they are. But I want us to be more of a resource for our children. I want them to know if they have a conflict, if they have a problem, if they have a situation, you can always come to a police officer and we're here to be your friend and support you. So I'm gonna end with that. And if you all have any questions at the end, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Monica Joseph. I'm the director of the construction, responsible for capital improvements as well as the management of SPLOS College. I'm here to update you on SPLOS 5 and the uh, inform you of the program for SPLOS 6. Uh, as most of you guys are aware, uh, SPLOS special purpose local sales tax is a penny tax uh, that funds capital improvements for other districts via new construction or renovations of existing facilities. Uh, to highlight some past projects of myself in the county, uh, SPLOS, SPLOS dollars were, were used to renovate uh, Lovejoy Middle School, um, as well as the turf on Club Oak Stadium. Uh, this past summer, we successfully replaced all the HVAC units at Lovejoy High School, as well as renovate the uh, gymnasium. This current, later this year, we will be renovating Brown Elementary, and uh, we will begin to design for a new elementary school, uh, Lovejoy Elementary School, that would be personal land on the south in the county uh, off of Panhandle Road. SPLOS 5 expires December 2019, which saved waste is SPLOS 6. On March 19th, 2019, we'll go to the community and ask them to renew uh, a SPLOS program. Again, this is not an additional tax, it's just to uh, 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 your tax rate won't change. Uh, but just we'll uh, renew it for an additional five years. The program includes a new STEM elementary school with new STEM middle school as well as a STEM high school along with a college and career academy. We will also be renovating um, Lovejoy High School. The stuff, the plus six program will also uh, uh, replace buses as well as fund the initiative to provide each student with a, either a Chromebook or a laptop. All in all, the SPLOS will generate $280 million and will be in force for five years. Again, I'm glad to answer any questions at the end of the presentation. At this time, I'll welcome back Dr. Beagle. Thank you, Ryan. So, I'll start with the SPLOS. Again, March 19, 2019, the community, the county will go for a vote. Ron mentioned some of the projects uh, that are being planned. And while we as staff can't tell the community how to vote in our official capacity, we can tell you this, that if the referendum passes, those things will occur. If the referendum fails, those things will not what? Occur. So the community has to decide, does it want those things to occur, or does it want those things not to what? Occur. Now if you sit back and just assume that somebody else is going to vote, shame on who? You. Don't assume other people are going to vote your interest. You do what? Regardless of how you vote, you get to the polls and what? You get to the polls and vote. What date did I say next year? March 19th. Now, you heard, you, you heard the data, you heard about school leadership, things we're working on. What I'd like you to get is that the work that we're doing is very complex. It didn't take the community, we didn't get here overnight, and it won't get solved how? Overnight. Overnight. But it does take a strategy, a very sophisticated, articulated, complex strategy. It does take a strategy. And so our strategy includes teaching and learning, school safety, school culture, ensuring we have nice facilities, because all of these things work in tandem to create a high-performing school system. Does that make sense, everyone? Now, Remember what I said earlier. The school is one part, a major part during the school day. But the school is only responding to oftentimes what the community does what? Sends to us. 
We have the best children that you have. And I let you keep them the best ones at home. We have the best children you have that you have. But we also know as a school system we're dealing with some of the impacts of poverty. It's not that people don't want to do well and they don't want the children to do well. We also, if we're educators, we, we've all studied and we know the impact of what? Of poverty. And so many times our students will come to kindergarten already behind them. Things that they should know that sometimes other children know because they come from families in which parents are possibly more educated and they have resources. Sometimes many kids who come from poverty don't come to school with those same advantages. And our teachers have to do what? Bring them up. So if every year, let's say I go to kindergarten, but I come to kindergarten two years behind, our kindergarten teachers do a great job. Our data shows us that our kindergarten teachers, no matter where the kindergarten start, they make significant progress in kindergarten. But the kindergarten teachers are not the only teachers that teach the students. But the kindergarten teachers, oftentimes, if they don't go to pre-K, you should know this, most of our kids don't go to pre-K. That could be uh, for a multitude of reasons, one being we don't have that many seats because of funding. But sometimes even when we do have seats, some families, and it's often the families with the less education, they choose not to send their kids where? The pre-K. It's amazing how the more educated families, the more educated families, the mom and dad, they're taking advantage of what? Pre-K. And that's an area that we're addressing. But so once the kindergarten teacher does what he or she needs to do, if the child is on grade level, then we, we've got to maintain grade level and even accelerate them. If the child is not on grade level, that teacher's going to do what he or she can in kindergarten, and then that child at the end of kindergarten is going to what grade? Now, when they get to first grade, what does the first grade teacher have to do? Possibly teach some of the stuff the kindergarten teacher didn't get to because the child was already what? And now they got to teach what they got to be, what they're required to learn in what grade? First grade. So that first grade teacher is going to do what he or she needs to do, try to get the child where they need to be by the end of first grade. But they got to also address some things that possibly didn't get addressed in kindergarten or not at the level that we would have liked them to be addressed. So by the end of first grade, where's that child going? Second grade, same scenario. By the end of second grade, where are they going? And you saw that's the first grade we take the test, right? And then we wonder why only 25% of our third graders are what? Proficient. See, one thing you've got to understand is that what we, this is a collective effort. It is just not the responsibility of the school system to improve outcomes. We're going to do our part. So what we've done, as Ray mentioned, we, we assess every child at the beginning of the year so we know where they are in reading and math. And then our teachers are working to imp implement strategies to eliminate all of those deficits. So if a child is in third grade, but they're reading on, let's say, second grade level. Our teachers are working to address that issue. But remember, while they're working to bring a third grader from second grade, at the end of third grade, what they should be pr pretty close to what grade level in reading? Fourth grade. So what we're dealing with is that when children already begin behind, it's very difficult. That's not just clay, it's around the nation. It's very difficult to what? to get them up to where they need to go. But it can be done. But it won't be done when you've got a chaotic school system. It won't be done when you focus on a whole bunch of what? Drama. It won't be done when the school and the families are not working out. It will not get done if all we're doing is on blogs tearing each other down. It won't get done if you, don't go, if you go to schools and you just go there to disrespect the principals and the teachers. And, and there's not a positive, healthy relationship. Y'all get my point? So, you know, some communities may have the luxury of talking about a lot of other stuff and being distracted. 
then some folks don't really have the luxury of being what? Distracted. We would be one of those. Chameleons. I'm just being honest, because that's just who I am. If you want to be a high-performing school system, we don't need to be what? Distracted from our work. Our work, and my, I'm very clear every day, this team is very clear. Our number one focus is to assure that our children, by the end of the day, the end of the grade, the year, they can read and do math on what? Grade level and higher, and we will not be distracted from that. Everything else is important, but at the end of the day, can they read on grade level? Can they do math where? That's the question that we're asking. And so we need principals and teachers and parents and students to come to the table and work out together. together so we can change the data in our district. Our goal is over the next five years, instead of 25 being proficient, 25% being proficient, we want a minimum of 80% what? Proficient and higher. We want 100, but we thought we'd shoot for 80. Does that make sense? So we've got work to do, but it takes all of us, all of us, all of us. And so at this time, we're going to open up the floor for Q&A, right? If you have questions or comments, this, is, this will be your opportunity. If you want to come to more meetings, go to the website, hit the link for Critical Conversation, and the entire schedule for the year is listed there. Superintendent Advisories, where you can continue to engage with us and hear others. Feel free, you're invited. So we'll just pass the mic. Okay. <coughs> um, I have a question in reference to the senior learning. We didn't discuss that tonight. Can you tell us about how many distinguished learners we have? The data reflected proficient and distinguished. Total. I didn't see it. Oh, it did it in there. So if you want to go to the website, if this PowerPoint is there. If, if the data for 20, uh, for 2017, 2018 says 25%, that's the total of proficient and distinguished. Okay. okay? But it doesn't take much to see that we don't have many distinguished learners. I'll say that. We don't. And that needs more. Oh, well, we, we got to get them proficient, don't we? Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> and then once we get them proficient, we can move them where? To distinguished. To distinguished. That's how it works. Another tool, um, I don't know if it's, uh, it's a department, 
parent made um, power purchases. But a re one reason why parents don't go to the parent grade um, meeting is because <coughs> we have to work. And a lot of times, I'm not trying to say anything negative, but when we go to the parent grade on meeting, it's the same old thing. It's almost like it's generic information. We need information that's going to cut us, you know, to the core. Um, like the GMAT, okay? What I would like to see, and this is about STEM, I'm all STEM. What I would like to see is for the parent liaison, if we have students, and it's, it's more, a little bit more complex for dealing with children. If we have students that can volunteer to be with the teacher who's doing dibble, or no matter what level you are, you will find out when you want to wait for high school to realize if the child can read on their level. Let's bring in Kate. Well, let me help you out. I want to make sure you're clear mm -hmm. because it's always good to be informed. Mm -hmm. The Dibbles is an assessment. Our teachers teach reading in grades kindergarten through second grade. We're teaching students how to read. Grades three through five, they're using reading to learn. So Dibbles is one tool that we use this year in kindergarten and first grade to assess students throughout the year to see how they're progressing in certain skills in the area of reading. In grades two and higher, we use Achieve 3000. And, and that tool basically assesses the comprehension, the reading skills and comprehension levels of students. It gives teachers do very good, robust reports that allow them to address those deficits. You should know, relative to Dibbles, remember I said Dibbles is a tool. There's a, an, an instructional in, in, intervention that goes with Dibbles. It's called BURST. It helps teachers to really address the specific needs relative to reading of students. Our teachers are being trained in that, and they'll be using that tool this year. And so I don't know if you should, it doesn't look like you have any ch children in kindergarten or first grade, not unless little man is in kindergarten or first grade. He said, no. no. But we have tools. We have our tools are research-based, they're evidence-based. And we as the educators, we've studied all the tools. We've looked at many tools and we've made a decision that these are the tools that we're going to use and that they are working for us. And so we're using that data as our teachers are teaching reading. And one thing we've, we've done even with that is the teachers who are teaching some of the lower performing students or the kids who are struggling in reading, we're requiring them to get reading endorsement. So we know that they know how to actually teach reading because teaching reading is a science. It's a science. And so we're making sure it's not uh, uh, fly by night or do it at, at one's own feeling or based on how you feel. There is, a, there is a scientific approach to teaching reading. And so we're ensuring that that is the case. Now, one thing that we've got to continue to do is remind you what I said earlier, that teachers are teaching reading. They've got to continue to address the gaps that students have while they teach the grade level skills. That is work. It's easier said than what? Than done. It takes everybody working together to get that done. There's so much that the teacher can do during the school day, and there's so much that probably should be happening at home. We're not expecting parents to teach reading if they don't have a degree in teaching. But we do, ex we do need parents to create certain environments where kids are encouraged to what? To read, that they're doing homework, et cetera, and then working with the teacher. And so I appreciate you sharing what you would like to see. I'm just telling tell you what we have and what we're using. And I need you, if you don't need me, let me know, but I need you to find your principal, whoever your principals are, and have a conversation with them about how those tools are actually being utilized to help identify the deficits that your children may have and how teachers are responding to that data to improve their outcomes. And so we have the tools in place. It's not the absence of tools. That's the issue. We've got to continue to implement our strategies, our instructional strategies, and we've got to make sure teachers and parents and principals and all are working together using that data to drive those decisions and those activities in the classroom and even the activities where? At home. 
and that's going to help us accelerate and improve these outcomes, okay? <laughs> I'm just helping you out. What would you do if, you, if the doctor told you, I've checked your, your pulse, I've checked this, I've checked that, and I need you to do that? You would tell the doctor, yes, sir, would you? He probably would, wouldn't would. <laughs> I'm your educational doctor. <laughs> <laughs> tell us. I have a student at Stillwell and also one at Lovejoy. And so this is a question regarding safety and security. With the security checks for weapons found at either school? No, ma'am. Um, we didn't find any weapons. And I'm pleased to say that we didn't find any weapons. Uh, but we do the unannounced checks for multiple reasons. One, as a deterrent to discourage you because they're unannounced. You never know when they're going to come. And then the next one, just to try to be preventive as not to have you know weapons on the campus. But then it goes back to the app. Um, and, and I'm pleased to say this. I'm, not, I'm going to be honest with you. Have we found weapons on our campuses in Clayton County? The answer would be absolutely we have. Um, I'm not going to be deceitful here. But what you don't know is that the reason or the means in which we discover that we have those weapons is because of the relationships that we have with the students because they come forward because they want the climate. Everybody wants to be in a safe environment, wouldn't you say? Don't, don't all of you? So the students come forward because they might see a person displaying their weapon on a bus, or they might hear a conversation with someone saying what they're going to do. So no, we have not the search today. As a matter of fact, we started early September, and we haven't found any weapons. But you know, again, that's because we're being preventative and trying to be proactive and trying to discourage the students. But over the years, we have, but it was discovered due to students coming forward saying, John has a weapon and we need to keep it off our campus. It goes back to Dr. Beasley. It's, that's that culture and climate of a safe school, and that's what we're striving for. Uh, I just would like to add, let me, let me make sure we're very clear. If a gun is in the school, it didn't start in the school. No. Someone made a decision to bring it from somewhere, yeah. probably a home, to the school. So why do I say that? Why do I stress that? Because I don't think there are many uh, 18 and younger folk out there buying weapons. If there are, then we've got a bigger problem. More than likely, an adult brought, brought the weapon. More than likely, an adult allowed the weapon to get out of their possession in the hands of a student who decided whatever for whatever reason to bring the weapon to school. So I say that to say this. Adults, we have got to do what we're supposed to do if we all if we all have a constitutional right to carry weapons. But put your weapons up, secure them, know where they are, and hold your children accountable. Teach your children weapon safety. The school is not the place. It is illegal to bring weapons to where? School. As educators, we can't even have them in our cars, and even if we own a weapon. And so chief effort is basically, the strategy is basically to <coughs> discourage, deter people from making decisions to bring weapons from wherever they get them to where? School. To the schoolhouse. I want to be very clear. We're not arming teachers in Clayton County. <laughs> We're trying to get weapons where? Keep them All out campus. of the school. We're not giving anybody else weapons. Our SROs have guns, and that's enough. We need everybody to get involved in case somebody decides to go crazy, because only they let somebody know if they're going to do something stupid. Use the app. Let us know. Everybody should be res everybody responsible for safety and what? Security. Keep your eyes open. Don't take anything for granted. And when you see as the uh, secure, safety and security doing the random checks, give them a thumbs up because you know sometimes oh you shouldn't do that. But as soon as something goes wrong, you're ready to fire the superintendent and the whole cabinet. <laughs> so we're trying to balance it all and create safe ex uh, environments for all of our students while we yet focus on teaching and learning. 
And we will, I'm sure, in this, in this, if we don't find a weapon this year, that'll be a blessing. But if we do, guess what? It's a blessing too, because we found it. Before it was used to harm somebody. Any other questions? Yes. Good evening. Um, my question is probably twofold. The first question is um, we, my wife and I, had a son graduated last year from a particular high school. I don't know, I should say in high school, it would be my little blast. But in high school, um, my wife went there a couple of times. He didn't see me get graduated. And she said she had a, I don't know the right word, a few bit discussion with a counselor. Um, and the, the environment that yeah, she got from the counselor was not a favorable one. The uh, attitude of the counselor was, well, you know, I got mine, you have to get yours. We didn't like that attitude, and I think she might have said something to that, in that you know, department, maybe not to the counselor directly. And I just mentioned that to say that we got to change that, that environment. No, you got to change that one person. Because yeah, that's true. I, 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 I reject. If, if that happened, that principal should have been informed. So the principal who supervises that counselor can correct. I'm not going to go and offend another counselor about that issue, and that is not that counselor's approach. And so that's where we got to build some trust in our administrators. You got It ain't about covering up and, and hiding and, and not disclosing who the individual is. Let that principal know, and that principal knows our expectation. That is inappropriate. Yes, we all have ours, but we're here to help others get there, huh? right? And so, but I want you to know, now, we can, of course, survey to see if that's a culture, but I, I would submit to you today that that is not the culture. Our kids are graduating with scholarships. we got great counselors, and I don't want to assume that one counselor who said something bad or inappropriate, that that is the pattern. So we need to know who that counselor is, that principal should know, Dr. Simpson should know, Dr. Nunez should know, somebody so we can deal with that counselor. We can go to that counselor. We've got to get, we've got to stop this one behavior and then we just, we just uh, impose that one behavior on everybody. No, let's deal with that one person. And so I would suggest that you think about letting the principal know. You don't have to do it in this setting either. Think about letting the principal know so that principal can address that. Don't give me work to do. Not that I'm out of my work, but I, right, it shouldn't have to get to me because that's something that can be easily corrected by letting the principal know. And our principals know that that is unacceptable. Um, just to give a, a, a round on that, that the principal is doing something I'm noticing, but we have another a student who's in middle school right now. <coughs> and let me say something. I'm going to give a shout out to Hawthorne, wonderful school. Wonderful middle, wonderful school. We'll stop there. Okay. Um, I'll talk to you on the side of that. Talk but, to me. Um, you can talk to him. Okay. We want to know which ones are not wonderful so we can figure out what we need to do okay. to help and get one. All right. Well, my second, <laughs> my second question is that what is the, the school district doing in relationship with the uh, Board of Commissioners here in Clayton County and with the Chamber of Commerce and probably even with um, the Atlanta Airport? Because I, I'm, as I drive around Clayton County, I run my Ford car. Um, there's so much open land there. Nobody's going through that land. The, the airport is in Clayton County, but it's called Atlanta. And we have so much money to bring revenue here in Clayton County that we can help out with the district, like I said, the culture and the environment between businesses and with the uh, school district. So you ask, what are we doing as a school system? All of us are meeting with the county commissioners. I sit on the Aerotropolis. Uh, I represent the education collective at the Aerotropolis, where I'm a part of the decision making. Uh, all of us are meeting with the commissioner, uh, the chairman of the commission, uh, all the commissioners. We have a relationship. We have superintendent advisories that uh, all of them are attending. We um, meet with the cities. We're involved as entities dealing with the issue relative to the federal aviation in the airport. And so, and clearly, beyond the school system, the county, the working to bring in more businesses. Um, housing sales, if you didn't know, have increased in Clayton County. Home constructions have increased in Clayton County. Uh, we're working to ensure that when we build our next few schools, we're building those schools in the right areas. 
Uh, we're, as a matter of fact, we're being very innovative. We're, we're even, uh, one builder is even interested in, in building a, basically a play, a, a school, a place to live, work, and play, and learn right in, in the community. So we're working to do that. Um, we're engaged. We are at every, we're presenting, I presented to the uh, Forest Park City Council the other night. Prior to that, the uh, Morrow's uh, City Council. And so we're engaged, we're at the table. If the team wants to add more information, uh, but we're all engaged in, in at the table involved in this work. The situation with Delta, uh, we believe that the school system had a lot to do with the outcome in that area. Uh, but we know that that's a temporary fix for a problem that will exist after December 2019. So we're still engaged with the commissioners and all the cities and others who have uh, a stake in this issue. And we're continuing to be engaged, strategize. We'll be, we'll be meeting with the delegation on, I believe, Thursday, Thursday, to continue to outline our legislative priorities because they're at, at advocating for it at the state level. Um, we're at Capitol Hill. You should know not only are the adults engaged, but our students are engaged. We'll have students at the Capitol Hill. There are 40 days in the session. We'll have students there every day because we want our students to know whatever decisions are made that impact your life, you need to be there. And so, I don't know what happened here too full, but we are engaged, we're at the table, we know what's going on, we're having input and we're doing, we're advocating for the resources and the opportunity for our school system, our children. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, this is the same question I tend to ask in most schools. I um, support or I have lots of friends and taught associates that have kids of my own. I have three. Um, and one has, I only have one left um, in high school. Um, I came here in 2010 uh, to Lovejoy. And during that time, although it was a recession, there was a lot of support from the business, businesses, and I mean not the smaller businesses only. I've noticed that a trend has changed you know, visually, um, not the numbers, that the larger companies that reside in our communities, especially the Jonesboro, um, Lovejoy, Hampton area, um, and going a little toward Ophir, I'm not seeing the same type of visual investment in our, in our town, um, city, our county, uh, as before. And I want to know what's the breakdown because I do see a great rise of small um, business, small businesses that are taking up the slack. But um, I, you can hear the tension in my voice. I feel like if uh, we're investing in them, then I should see some vesting in the community. I don't know, basic stuff. If I'm near Money's Mill, I should see at least a Money's Mill, some a flyer or a paper inside the building. If there is a luxury game, why is Chick-fil-A the only one holding it down? And, and they need some kudos for that because um, I'm just not seeing this type of support to our county when we're giving them a lot of support to their bottom line. And I want to know what the breakdown is because um, I've been hiring on this for about three years now, and I want to know what's going on. Well, I want you to see Dr. Smith. At, I'm going to make a few comments, and I'm going to pitch it to them. But you're right. Um, and that's one reason we instituted a new department called Partnership now, it's Governmental Relations and Community Relations. It's important. And so one thing that we're doing, we're revitalizing the partnership program. Um, and we are working with our principals to act, actively recruit and uh, bring in partners to support the schools. But we're gonna take it to another level. We're going to formalize these partnerships and we're going to be acknowledging who these partners are because we need to get a little smarter with who we support. If businesses in your community don't support your children, then you don't need to support the business, period. And so what we, we're going to do is identify formalize the partnerships and we're, we're in the process of creating some type of uh, banner or something that can hang, business, businesses can hang in there. 
store their establishments that will acknowledge that this business actually supports partners without school system. We're going to even put that on the website. Um, Dr. Smith, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, we're actually soliciting uh, every business, regardless of its size, in Clayton County. We have a database that we got from the Chamber of Commerce. But in addition to that, we're also uh, reaching out to each school to see who they've been working with in the past and currently to make certain, as Dr. Beasley said, that not only do we formalize that partnership, but we get the schools to engage more. And what one of the one of the things that we are going to do with more aggression than we've done in the past is we're going to ask for support. We're going to ask everybody, whether it's funding, whether it's human capital, whether it's resources or materials, whatever, but we're going to ask everybody in Clayton County and surrounding areas to support our school system by reaching out to them. And partnerships are a two-way relationship. We want to do something to help their bottom line as well by making the community aware of their involvement with the school so it can help boost their bottom lines and, and, and displaying some of the things that are going on in their businesses through our websites and through our newsletters. So we want to help them, but we are going to ask them to help us. And that process uh, is, is going on right now. I would imagine within the next few weeks, um, the businesses will start receiving these uh, solicitations. And it is our goal and our vision as you go throughout Clayton County, dotted through all of the businesses, there's a big banner that says, I'm a proud supporter of Clayton County Public Schools. So they won't get it if they're not supported. Right. So you all will be able to identify. And, and a few other things, too. And I'd be more than happy to speak offline with you after this meeting so I can go a bit more in depth, not only with you, but whomever is uh, willing to inquire about it. <coughs> and you should know, we're pursuing you. And we know we have a lot of small businesses, right? There, we're going in another vein, another strategy is to have some opportunities to connect with the CEOs of some of our larger corporations as well. And I want to just throw this out there. The Deltas and all of these corporations that we all spend money with, uh, we want them to be visibly supportive uh, of our school, of our children and our school system. And so we're very appreciative that Delta has, uh, they've sent us two checks so far to help with the aviation fuel issue, and one check, the most recent check was over a million dollars. And so, but after December of 2019, my conversation is, can the checks keep flowing to help our children? And, and we're not, a, I'm not embarrassed to, to say, because a lot of businesses benefit from the infrastructure and the community and the population, et cetera. We're, what, the fifth largest county? And the only reason they don't is because they think they can. They don't have to. They think they can get by with it. But it's just a different day. So hey, go over there. You, you look like you, we may need to put a put a Clayton County tag on you. <laughs> <laughs>
be given an amount. But the best schools all have ten thousand dollars. But they don't. But I can I can tell you, Mom, they don't only serve autism autistic students because there's not enough autistic students to fund the school. That's what I'm saying. It's learning. Yeah. Several different learning resources. Um, it would be nice if we had. I would love to be his big approach. If we were to be the first that would bring schools for students like him, it would take it off. No, those schools are part of slot six. I mean, the slot is back down. That's correct. Right. 
But we are talking about STEM. But whether or not those systems have so many seats. Because we vote, right? So how does this vote affect me wherever I'm sorry? Wherever this school is going to be. And how is it going to affect me? Because you want me to vote? But what am I voting for? What, where, where is this school going to be? I think I'm old enough to so let me tell you, you I'm a role play. So this STEM school might be on Lovejoy out here. How does this affect my son on the other side of the town? Well, then. But you want me to vote for my town? But listen, Mom. You know, I mean, I'm just questioning. You're doing good, though. You're doing good. You see, Mom? That's okay. That's okay. That's what we want to hear. But you see, Ronnie, right there? See, and this is why this is what we call agency. When you come here, that's why we're here. So you'll see, okay, I'm you got to go to. Yeah. He's over construction. Okay. And so I want you to ask construction. That's for planning. I right. think, but then guess what? All of that's related. Okay. So I want you to go and talk to him. Okay. So when we, are, when we come back as a team and we be brief about the meeting, we make some good points. The question is that we're going to have is what are the points that she made? How are we taking that into consideration? That's part of that engagement, right? Very good. Okay. You should look good. Actually, this is my point. There's a lot of parents that do not come out to these meetings. And, but I mean, I think there's a lot of parents that don't come out to the meetings, but then they want to stay in the background in the park. We, we as parents, we have voices. The only way you're going to be heard is if you're being included. I apologize. I <laughs> so we have to come out um, together. I don't want to say people because it, it, it seems like we're community. excluded, but community. We yeah, have to come out. Um, Clayton yeah. County does have a good thing because for the reason, I have sons. It's hard to get more to read. More is hard to read. Some like to read, some don't. But then we all have. Um, library. They had the summer program that you can read, that you get the sports tickets. And there were incentives. Parents have to know their resources. And if you listen to your teachers, they give you your resources that you need. Some parents don't want to go that route. So let's keep it real. I mean, there's just some that don't want to go that route. And then they get upset with the teachers. And I'm going to say this today. When we had milestone testing last this year, a parent came out and took a child out of school to a milestone testing to get her rhythm. Mm -hmm. and, and I was volunteering that day. And then I'm sitting there, so you know, God made it flip that I turned around and when her child failed, I said, no, 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 you can't be upset because you took your child out to get a hit done. These parents are not, the parents are younger, I'm older. Parents are much younger, and they don't think those things are important because they don't think their kids are going to need it as they grow up. No. The test won't benefit the kids. It doesn't benefit the parents. It doesn't benefit the parents. It supports the Well, that's a ph philosophical question. But, <laughs> but, but the, this would be the point I think you want to make. The assessment is to show students that, that are on proficient on grade level. We need students on grade level and high because I'm telling you all, there's not a career that they can go into that they will not need further training. And in order to read technical manuals, you gotta have a level of what? Comprehension and critical thinking. And so I don't get stuck over the Georgia milestone because I don't make an issue about that test because I know as a, as a father of four, I hadn't had an area my children wanted to go into that they aren't required to take a what? Test. I'm getting stuck over tests. My daughter wants to be a doctor. She's got to take the MCAT just to get even considered for medical school. And so you want to be a lawyer, you got to take the bar. You want to be a teacher, you got to take the gates. You want to be whatever. You got to take something. And so I don't want us to get stuck over tests. The bottom line is this Are we teaching students what they need? in order to be ready for their post-secondary options, whether they go to college or career. We gotta make sure that our kids are what? Ready to exercise their options, okay? All right, I think we're ready.
Hey, good evening. My name is Dr. Renita Gibbs, and I have a couple questions. The first question I want to find out, how do I need to go about get, being involved with your advisory committee? Thank you, Tay. Tay, can you answer that for? Yes, ma'am. You can contact me, or we can see me immediately after the meeting. Okay. we got none to select. Okay, very good. That's the first question. That's why I'm here. I had worked out, and she called me and said, the superintendent is in the in the building. I <laughs> came back with my gym clothes because I've been waiting on this opportunity. <laughs> Um, the second thing is that I have one son over at Lovejoy High School and, you know, academically, no issues because we work with our kids very much. And I have a son that went to Lovejoy and graduated early and he's doing very well in college now. But my thing was, I just been very, I speak a lot in the schools and I've just been very disappointed with what I see, not because of the students, because of some of the teachers in some of the schools. And I have spoken several of the schools in Clayton County and I know in order to be a leader, you have to know how to lead. And I'm just very disappointed with the, the appearance of some of the teachers that I see, because you're going to work. And when I see teachers coming looking like they're going to the picnic, I have a problem with that. And then when I see kids walking around and the teachers are not saying anything, I got a problem with that. Even when I go into the schools for career day. Now when I was in college, I mean when I was in school, we taught them how to dress. Because, you know, career day means career. And, and I have a problem with the fact that you know, it's career day. We're preparing our students for the future. So when I go into schools and I see various teachers dress inappropriate, the, the, the kids don't be dressed inappropriate. And I just want to know how can I connect with you guys because I have a word and I have something that I can offer Clayton County. Thank you very
And he was speaking on St. Thomas was the bonus of the airport equipment. So what I had heard about this, nobody still knew. But that affects the whole St. Thomas, not just my school, because we close to the airport. But what you need so to do, you got to go back, you got to go to the website. Ain't going to be the next two weeks. And like, we, we do budget this year, right, for next year, right? Right? And that's how that works. We, we do a budget every about, year. But we do the year before next year, right? We do the budget. We, do we do talk about budget for next year, this year, right? That's cool. And, and so I've not heard this out in public. This is Google. So that's something we need to speak on, like, when the boat come up. But what I'm telling you all is this. You said this was your okay. first meeting. I want you to, all the previous meetings, we have the video out there. It's all there. We haven't hit anything. I want you to know that. I know this is your first meeting. No, 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 this is my first public meeting. That's what all my stuff keeps saying. I want to get it straight. But that's something that we need to speak on in the Of course. Because that's what I thought. Okay, I'm young. I own my properties. I own property. I pay taxes at the same time. You would think that was something that we would speak on in general since we got a vote. And anybody sit on it, that type of food is sitting on the table as we vote for somebody. Oh, it's airport here, and we're gonna cut kind of school, fifty million thousand dollars and shit. You know what I'm saying? So I mean, you know, taxes, we take pay, right? That's what we need to tax raise and feed and stuff. That's correct. All right, so we're gonna put it in the school. Okay. Yeah, I keep paying stuff, but ain't nobody asking. And I know it's a little bit because George Fred, you know, who the fool, but I mean, you know, come on, that's for real. We got it. Just speak on what the money we got. That was, I had to hard, that this was not good. We got it. All right. We've got time for two more questions. If it is young lady in the front of this gentleman to my side. Yeah, I have a question for you. Thank you for sharing. I really do appreciate your passion. Um, so we're going to look for you at the next meeting, right? All right. All right. So my question is about the affidavits the affidavits that parents use at schools. What exactly can we do or what are we doing to manage that? Okay. And I think you already know why I'm asking. I don't have to elaborate. Uh, so if you want to address the affidavits, you may want to explain what they are. So, 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 so for those that, that don't know what an affidavit is, it's if I just happen to move into the particular area and reside with someone at their apartment or a house, the, the, the person that is registered at that particular complex or that owns that home will go to the school and fill out a form. It's called an affidavit. And the homeowner or the person that's uh, rent, renting that apartment agrees and fills out the application that says that I am residing at that particular address. So here's the unfortunate piece right here. Can you also elaborate that? Could you also elaborate the effect of that when we have too many or when it's this? Right. So, so the, the impact or the negative impact, but let me, let me back up a little bit and share this. Clayton County is the most transient county in the entire state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. Let me say that one more time. We are the most transient. We have the highest mobility rate in the entire state of Georgia, meaning we have children, we have families that move from complex to complex, home to home, county to county, almost daily. We register and we register and withdraw a child at 90% of our schools every single day. And an affidavit obviously makes that easier because apartment complexes have something called move-in specials. How that benefits someone is if they sign a six-month lease, a move-in special at the next apartment complex offers one or two months free rent. So at month five, they bail out. Here's what's interesting, though. We have apartment complex owners that own multiple complexes. One in particular owns 13 apartment complexes in Clayton. So it's easy for him because the persons that's moving or the families is moving from one complex is moving to another one of his complexes. Now, unfortunately, we can't control that. So very good question. Very good question. But here, here's the thing that, that we've emphasized our, our, our leaders to do. Build a relationship based on genuine care, concern, and love with that child and with that parent 
that they want, that the experience at that school is so overwhelming that they wouldn't want to leave your school. But we understand that a parent and a family, they have to do what they have to do. That's the reality of it. And that's the piece that we can't control, we want to control, but that's the unfortunate piece that we just can't control. So I'm certainly aware, we are aware of what the affidavits do and what they cause and how that creates a problem, but that's just something that we just, we, we just can't, now what, what, one thing we can do a better job of, and this is something we will we'll be implementing. The process of an affidavit has to be updated at the end of every semester. I can't say we're doing an extremely good job with that, meaning that at the end of every semester, you're supposed to bring in documentation, i.e. utility bill, utility bills, uh, phone bills, some records that indicate or validates that you're still living or residing at that particular address. But uh, we, that's just something we have to show up on. What it is that, that I've been seeing or what I see or what I've heard, you know, have been other people's experience, is that kind of a little bit about what you're talking about, how this school offers these wonderful, just wonderful programs, and so everybody wants to now come over to this school. So it might not be that type of situation that Dr. Simpson just shared, but what it is is that, oh, now I want to go over to this school, so now you have 100,000 people, I'm exaggerating, going, going to this school, and then you got 10 people over here at this school. Nobody wants to come over here at this school, but this school is empty, and now this school is overcrowded. And so because of that, you have that imbalance, or now you have all the good kids over here at this school, and then now you have this school having the negative test scores or having behavior issues and so forth and so on. So that's the other issue that comes up from people using affidavits. Or simply put, I have, you know, I've seen where people are like, well, I want my cousin to go to school with his other cousin and, and my mother and my sister and my whoever, so now I'm gonna use an affidavit to so that they can all go to school together, you know. So yeah, I do believe in a caring environment where you want to support the family, but then again, like you say, it causes it creates that imbalance and that imbalance throughout the county. So that's why I asked the question about what it is that we can do to better manage that so that we can see a better balance. Good evening. What is the retention rate for teachers, and what are you doing to attract high, high quality teacher positions? I love that. What was our retention rate this year? Good evening. Um, the retention rate was probably 84, 85 percent. Uh, last school year. Uh, part of that was coupled with the fact that um, we, we didn't need to necessarily hire as many teachers that we've, that we've hired in the past. Um, comparatively speaking, uh, this school year we opened school with I think about 86 vacancies uh, at the beginning of the school year. Um, compared to past years, I think we may have had between four, around 400 or so. Um, so the retention rate is about 85, 80, 84, 85 percent in terms of retaining teachers. We've uh, one of our priorities. High quality. High quality. Yes, that's a part of the, 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 one of our priorities. That um, you know we have to start with where we are. Um, so what we're doing as part of one of our priorities, we're working with the curriculum and instruction department to actually measure and gauge the effectiveness of a teacher by looking at their, evaluate, their required annual evaluation, we're looking at some assess, student assessments to see if they're showing growth, and we're gonna take a picture to kind of see if they are showing growth. We'll get them support that they need. If they're not showing growth, then we'll have to have some conversations about whether or not this is the right place for you. But we started a retention task force to look at how do we retain those high quality teachers. First, we identify who they are. How do we retain them? What are the, the barriers to retaining our teachers? And what we probably are going to find is that there are some things that we can do better. Um, but in order to do better, we have to find out what those things are. Well, we're starting this year with the retention task force. We started seven, the 18-19 school year. Our first meeting for the task force, I think, is October 2nd. Well, it's a process. It's not something that we can say that... You know, at the end of this year, we're going to have this. So it's a process that we're starting this year. Let me make sure you heard. 
At the beginning, when I was appointed superintendent, you had about 500 vacancies at the start of the school year. This year, you only have 86. Spread over 67 sites. Over 67 schools. So that may be two or three years. Huh? It does, and let's say it does sound better, doesn't it? And so the point, well, the, the point is this. The point is this. And so I'm going to respond to you. Well, make sure we're clear. Clayton County is what the second, or the second, or second highest paying district in the metro area. Well, this is my point. I think you may have been here earlier. People come, teachers come to school systems based upon their perceptions of the community. And so what we gotta do is ensure that we're sending out positive messages about our community. Because nowadays when people look for jobs, they can Google about Clayton, they can Google about Clayton County School, they can Google about our community. And if they come to the metro area, they got many options, don't they? So what are they looking for? They're looking for the communities that have positive what? Messages that are improving in their performance. And that's why it's all important. And so yes, we've got a rec rec uh, recruitment effort, but we've got to retain quality teachers. We have identified quality teachers. We have some that we know that are not necessarily the quality that we would like. So we're working with principals to address those teachers. But remember, all of us are responsible for recruitment by what we do as a what? As a community, okay? And then once we bring them, you got to create an environment that they want to stay. And so pay is important, but most don't leave because of pay, do they? They leave because of discipline, they leave because of disrespect, or they leave because of the, they don't feel supported by leadership, et cetera, et cetera. So it takes all of us, superintendent, principals, teachers, parents, community at large, to ensure that we recruit people and that we what? Retain people. So when you say, what are you doing? My question is always, what are we doing? Okay. If there are particular routes that are late, we just need to figure out where, where, where they're late. But let me tell you what one of the challenges our county is, not only this place, but everywhere. There's a shortage of bus drivers. Okay? And so when we do have bus drivers, if there's a shortage, they gotta double up on routes. And so that's, again, pay is important. And so we're working to increase the pay, but also, Bus drivers, I had one to tell me that basically they're leaving because our children need to behave better. So I'm trying to get everybody to understand. If, yeah, we gotta pay them, but once we pay them, it's hard to drive a bus with children cutting up behind you. And so all of it matters. And so, that's part of the problem. You say keep it real, right? We need our children to behave. That means we got to remember, we got 55,000 of them, don't we? A whole lot of different parenting philosophies in here, in this school system. But if everybody could do what I told mine, you're going to go to school, you're going to behave. And if I have to come up there for some issue, that's going to be a bit that you wish I had to have to do. But see, everybody have to, everybody have to do that, All right? But anyway, is that it? Thanks everybody for coming. It's been a great evening. We're here if you need us.